I am introducing Sir Emerson to you. Emerson, what are you doing up here? 16, 16, 21 through, oh, Matthew 16, 21 through 28. Please stand. Okay, turn to your, you want to do it down here? From then on, Jesus began to speak plainly to his disciples about going to Jerusalem and what would happen to him there, that he would suffer at the hands of the Jewish leaders, that he would be killed, and that three days later he would be raised to life again. But Peter took him aside to Roman remonstrate with him, Heaven forbid, sir, he said, this is not going to happen to you. Jesus turned on Peter and said, get away from me, you Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are thinking merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Then Jesus said to the disciples, if anyone wants to be a follower of mine, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For anyone who keeps his life for himself shall lose it, and anyone who loses his life for me shall find it again. What profit is there if you gain the whole world and lose eternal life? What can be compared with the value of eternal life? For I, the Son of Mankind, shall come with my angels in the glory of my Father and judge each person according to his deeds. And some of you standing right here now will currently live to see me coming in my kingdom. And this is the word of the Lord. All right, thank you, Emerson. It's good to have our kids with us and leading us. And it's also good to have kids, right? So we do have little baby Malachi over here, by the way, if you haven't seen him, he's a cutie. And on Thanksgiving evening, Harris Strangard was born. If you know Alex and Natalie, they've been expecting and we want to celebrate them, too, so yay, Harris. Yeah. Good job, Natalie, too, right? Um, so celebrate them, and uh, another little baby to, we're trying to fill up our nursery, that's our goal, is to get those gals some people to hold, some little children to hold. So uh, we want to bless the Strand Guards with some meals. So uh, Carrie has put together a meal schedule. If you're interested in, in cooking a meal for them and taking it to them in the next couple weeks, you can talk to her. Or you can go to the info booth, and there's a sign-up sheet back there. We'd like to invite you to do that. Um, I want to tell you a story uh, about a family friend of ours. We have some friends who um, have, I think they have five kids too, just like we do. But one of their daughters, who is now about 15 years old, about six or seven years ago, um, she started exhibiting symptoms of a neurological disorder, basically. She was about nine years old and a very lively young girl. And then all of a sudden, uh, she wasn't able to walk normally. And they've uh, been to many, many doctors and many, many clinics, and they've tried to figure this out. And over time, she would have basically these muscle spasms that were uncontrollable, and she couldn't control her legs and her arms. And over time, it's actually just wreaked havoc on her body to where she's bound to a wheelchair now. She's 15 years old, and her, her back is so bent from, from the muscle spasms. I, th I think they said her back curvature was at like 60% or something like that. And it's really, it's really grueling. They have some hope in that in the last six months, they think they've diagnosed a genetic neurological disorder that they're able to attempt to treat. And this last weekend, she had two procedures done where they went in and put some probes into her, in deep into her brain that'll be connected to a little signal box that'll send electrical signals to her brain in the hopes 
that it will be able to reverse some of the disease, some of the effects of it, and also uh, put a stop to these uncontrollable muscle spasms. Really, it's a really serious thing. It's really scary for her and has been difficult for her for almost half of her life. And as I was talking to Carrie about it the other day, I just looked at her and said, God surely has something huge planned for her if she's already at this point in her life gone through so much suffering at such a young age. And even to say that is kind of tipping my hand a little bit that I think that God can actually use suffering and for good in our lives, where as Americans, most of us, for the most part as Americans, we don't see suffering as a legitimate part of a well-lived life. G.K. Chesterton, the famous British um, Catholic writer in the early part of the 20th century, wrote, the Christian ideal or the Christian way of life has not been tried and found wanting It has been found difficult and left untried. Now, like I said a minute ago, most of us don't see suffering as a legitimate legitimate part of a life well lived. We try to do all that we can to avoid or minimize or get around or get out of suffering in our lives. And I don't think we're alone in that because I think Jesus' own disciples saw suffering in the same kind of way. We, Emerson just read that for us. We go back up to verse 21 here in Matthew 16. And Jesus has just explained to his disciples that he must soon suffer and die and be raised again. And then Peter, right, the disciple nicknamed the rock, Peter stands up and he would have none of this negative talk from Jesus. None of this talk about suffering and death. Because to Peter's mind, There could be no way that God would be pleased with Jesus and at the same time allow Jesus to suffer like he was describing. The two couldn't go hand in hand. Now, how many of us, the question is, how many of us see life through the same lenses, through the same glasses that Peter was wearing? Do you have those glasses on as you view life, as you view your own relationship with God and how God works in our lives? How many of us, here's the second question, how many of us need those glasses to be ripped off our faces, thrown on the ground, and trampled on? Which is exactly the grace that Jesus gives to Peter when he looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. Peter had arrogantly placed himself in front of Jesus And Jesus returns the favor by forcefully putting Peter back behind him in his proper place. Because a true disciple of Jesus Christ cannot place himself ahead of Jesus. We don't get to place ourselves in front of Jesus. We must stay behind him. So now that Jesus has has told Peter, get behind me, he then turns to the rest of disciples. So verse 23, get behind me, Peter. Get Get behind me, Satan. And now he turns to the rest of his disciples and and says, if anyone would come behind me, here's how they must live. Here's what they must do. Now, your English translation probably says in verse 24, after me, if anyone comes after me. It's actually the same phrase that's used in verse 23. So get behind me, Satan. If anyone would come behind me, he must deny himself, take up his cross And follow me. So, what Jesus is really teaching in this passage, he's teaching us what it really means, what it really costs to be a disciple. But I think even more than that, and lock this one in your brains, even more than just teaching us what it costs to be a disciple, I think Jesus is actually teaching us what it costs not to be a disciple. What it costs to not be a disciple. Either pick your, however you want to say it. He's teaching us what it costs not to be a disciple. The word for disciple literally means follower, student, apprentice. And to be a disciple is to follow Jesus wherever he goes. And where did he just say he's going? He's going to the cross. Now, I want to spend a few minutes on grammar here. The inner inner logic of this passage, um, of this short teaching, just really four verses. I'm handling 24 through 27 today. 
we can see there's some little connecting words that help us to understand what Jesus is saying. So follow along with me here, if you will. He makes a statement in verse 24. He then gives a reason for that statement. If you look at the very beginning of verse 25, Matthew 16, you see the little word for, F-O-R. And then he gives a subsequent reason for that reason in verse 26, which begins with for. And then he gives another reason in verse 27, which begins with another for. So three verses in a row begin with that word for, for, for. He's giving reasons, stacking these reasons one on top of another. And sometimes it's helpful when you have a string of reasoning like this where it goes four, 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 to flip the passage around, flip it over on its head, and read it backwards, replacing each four with a therefore. So I'm going to do that for you now. We're going to read that passage backwards, starting with verse 27. And instead of four, I'm going to slip in a therefore. And here's how it goes. And I have it up here if you have eyes that can read that. If not, you'll just have to read it backwards in your Bible. Verse 27, The Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay each person according to what He has done. Therefore, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Therefore, Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Therefore, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And this is how we're going to work through the passage. We're going to work through it backwards today because it, to me it helps clarify what Jesus is actually trying to say. In short, here's what's happening. The inner logic of Jesus' crucial teaching on discipleship grounds the desired behavior, which is in verse 24, of a disciple, the the desired action, the desired lifestyle of a disciple. It grounds that behavior in the desired future of a disciple, verse 27. He grounds our behavior, verse 24, in our future, verse 27. So we're going to start there in verse 27 with the coming judgment. The Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. This is the foundation of this entire section, because what it does is provides the motivation for discipleship. And the motivation that Jesus gives for discipleship is the future end time judgment, the the reconciliation of all things. When Jesus, the Son of Man, stands or sits on his throne... And judges the living and the dead, as the creeds tell us. Now, to us, this might seem like what Jesus is trying to motivate us is with with fear. So in other words, you know what? You better be good or else. This is going to happen. You better act like I want you to or else. But I think that what Jesus is putting before the disciples is not mainly the fear of punishment. Now, that's certainly part of the equation. It's not mainly the fear of punishment, but rather the hope of reward. Now, Jesus says that each of us will be repaid according to what we've done, according to how we live, how we've behaved, our works. And the works or behavior for which we will be repaid will become clear when we get to verse 24. But for now, we're simply considering the motivation that should undergird how Jesus calls us to live or behavior. Okay, so Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man is going to come with his angels, the glory of his Father, repay each person. And that image, that, that title really, it's, it's Jesus' favorite way of talking about himself is as the Son of Man. This refers to a figure from the Old Testament book of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 7, the Son of Man comes, the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days, and he comes in the context of judgment. As the empires or the kingdoms of the world are all being judged for their arrogance, for their rebellion against God. And at the end of the day, no no godless kingdom building program, whether it's your own kingdom building program or it's on a global level, no kingdom building program aside from God's will stand. 
So all these kingdoms, all these rulers who have built their, who have built their reign, and he's talking about Assyria and Greece and Babylon and Rome, they're all pictured as various beasts in the book of Daniel. And they eventually, though, in Daniel 7.12, it says, they have their dominion taken away. They are judged. And then Daniel sees something amazing in this vision. Here's what he sees in Daniel 7, verse 13. It says, with the clouds of heaven... There came one like a son of man, like a, in a human form. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented, presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." So here we have this human, divine figure, and, and Jews would have read this as, oh, this is the Messiah because he's been given a kingdom, dominion, that will never end. That's exactly what God promised to his Messiah. So this must be him. And now Jesus is standing with his disciples and saying, that's me. This is who Jesus is claiming to be, the Son of Man who will inherit the kingdoms of the world and all tribes, tongue, people, and nations will serve him. Now, but get this. That's amazing. But get this, because two verses later, excuse me, just a few verses later, we read something that's maybe, to my mind, it's even more unbelievable in verse 18. It says, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. So hold on, the Son of Man gets the kingdom, and now it's saying the saints of the Most High will receive and possess a kingdom, a forever kingdom. Verse 27, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. I mean, this is incredible. Think, think about what's happening here. The Son of Man, Jesus, he comes in the glory and power of his kingdom. It says that his people, his saints, are holy ones. That's what saints means, is holy ones. And by the way, throughout the New Testament, Christians are called saints, holy ones. His people, we even, will receive and possess the kingdom along with Jesus. Is that believable? It seems, unbel it seems crazy to me. But we connect this back to Matthew 16, and Jesus has already made clear that, that those people who truly follow him are the ones who have given up their own kingdom-building schemes and have repented and submitted to Jesus as king. And now Jesus connects us to Daniel 7, and he says that these same followers, these disciples who've given up their own kingdoms are the very people who will one day receive from him a share in his kingdom as a reward. That's pretty motivating. Pretty motivating reward, if you ask. We get to rule with Jesus forever. So I think we're beginning to get a picture of what Jesus means by losing your life in order to gain it, aren't we? There's something incredible in store for those who follow Jesus. So in light of this coming judgment of both reward and punishment, Jesus asks in verse 26, he asks two rhetorical questions that now, in my mind, make a ton of sense in light of that. Here's the first one, and this is, you have to bear with my own translation here, but this is how I put it to kind of bring out the sense of it. For what will be gained by a person if he should obtain the entire world but forfeit his true life? What shall be gained by a person if he should obtain the entire world but forfeit his true life? And the, the answer, of course, is, is nothing, right? You'll gain nothing if you give up your life. That should be obvious, right? But the question is, is it? Is it obvious? Take, take a minute and place yourself in your own shoes, okay, in your own life, smack dab in the middle of where you are in this 
real world with all that the world has to offer, all the things you're excited about, all the things you want to do with your life. Think of the things you want to experience. Think of places you want to travel. Think of the relationships that you cherish the most, the, the things you want to enjoy, the, the toys, the stuff you want to own. Think of, think of the responsibilities and activity and people and work and bills and debt and dreams. All these things that take up your attention every day. Now imagine yourself losing all of that in a moment. What does that do to your heart? Does your heart sink? Does it skip a beat? Does it feel lighter? <laughs> oh, get rid of all that debt in just a minute? Wow. Does it feel more free? I mean, what is the... What is going on in your heart when you think of losing all of that? Now, as 21st century Americans, we have a lot. Compared to most of the people that inhabit planet Earth, many of us, compared to them, have obtained the entire world. But say you had everything. Say you had all the money, all the power, all the fame, all the stuff. Would it really be gain if you had to give up your soul in exchange for it? If you had to make that deal with the devil, give me the world and I'll give you my soul. And the Greek word for soul is the word where we get the word psyche from, like psychology. And the word can mean soul, it can mean life, or it can mean self. It doesn't mean mind, it means soul, life, or self. And it really, really refers to our true self, our true life, the entirety of your being, your substance, your complete existence, who you truly are. So your soul, your true life, is the most valuable thing you can ever possess. But too often, instead of valuing our souls or protecting our souls as we should, we're willing to trade them in for all the stuff that the world offers. Is that a good deal? And I, Jesus doesn't seem, seem to think it is. Which begs his second rhetorical question. What is there in the world of equal value that a person can offer up in exchange for his true life? In other words, what Jesus is saying, when you're standing before me at the judgment, what kind of bargain are you going to strike for your soul? What are you going to offer in trade? What are we going to barter? I've got your soul. What are you going to give me, Jesus says? Is there anything you could possibly possess that would even begin to approach the value of your true life, of your soul? With all the money, all the power, all the fame, all the stuff, will that be enough? The answer, of course, is no. Your soul is priceless and nothing in the world Nothing that the world has to offer can match it in value. So you should probably pay attention to that. Now, Jesus, interestingly, in verse 25, actually flips things on their head for a moment. And what I'm just labeling is a grand paradox. And here's how it goes, just in three simple statements. He's already said, your soul or your true life is the most valuable thing you possess. Therefore, in verse 25, he's going to say, therefore, the very best thing you can do is to throw your life away. Because the only way to truly possess your soul is to let go of your life. Okay, let me say that again. Your soul, your true life is the most valuable thing you possess. Therefore, the very best thing you can do is to throw your life away because the only way to truly possess your soul is to let go of your life. Verse 25, for whoever would save his life. That's the same word, by the way, that's translated as soul in verse 26. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life, same word again, for my sake will find it. Again, here's my translation. For whoever wishes to grasp on to this life will lose everything. But whoever gives up this life for my sake will find his true life. 
So there's a play on words here. Jesus is, is using the same word to refer to two very different things. So the question then becomes, what is life to you? When you think of life, is it this so-called life, your visible, tangible, everyday life in this fallen world? A life which is so often blind to the spiritual, ignorant of God, and ignorant of his kingdom. Is that life, this world, and all it has to offer, is that life to you? Or do you think of life as something bigger, something deeper, something that can't be gained with money or toil or good looks or youth or luck? You see, one version of life is me building my kingdom. The other version of life is laying down my kingdom in exchange for God's kingdom. Because if you choose the first, if you choose the building my kingdom in this world life, all you will be able to one day do is to watch that life slip through your fingers. It's fleeting. It will disappear like smoke and you will lose it all in the end. But if you're willing to toss that so-called life out the window, to willingly release it from your grip right now, stop building your own king, kingdom, then and only then will you discover true life. So if you grasp at this life, if you try to retain it, you'll find that in the end you've lost out on true life. But if you let your grip on this life go, you will discover true life freely, fully placed in your hands. Now, this is all great, but the question is, what does it mean? How do I actually live that out? What does that look like? How do I tangibly let go of my life in order to gain my soul? It's the question that's begged now, which takes us to verse 24. The logical conclusion, this is the answer to the question of how. Jesus is really clear here. Matthew 16, 24, he tells his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Gaining true life can only take place through following Jesus, coming after Jesus, coming behind him. In fact, true life and following Jesus are really inseparable realities. You can't separate the two. Jesus is saying, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to find your true life in the end, at the judgment, if you want to inherit this kingdom, here are the necessary requirements. Here's how to do it. Two simple steps. You ready? It's super simple. Step one, deny yourself. And Jesus isn't talking here about doing the whole 30 Skipping dessert, really denying myself by not going back for thirds after th for Thanksgiving dinner. That's not what he's talking about. The phrase means something more like renouncing my claims on myself. It can actually be translated as disowning. So Jesus is saying, unless you disown yourself, unless you give up all claims to authority in your own life, unless you actively hand over the ownership of your life to me, you cannot be my disciple. The Apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 6, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Flip that around. You were bought with a price, therefore you are not your own. Consider that verse for a moment. If the first part of that verse is not, your, is not true in actual practical fact, in, in other words, if you don't live a life where you are not your owner, if you live a life where you retain ownership and control of yourself, then the second part of that verse cannot be true either. If you have to control and own your own life, then you have not been bought with a price. You have not been redeemed. If you're intent on saying, I am my own, then you also declare, I have not been bought at a price. I am not Christ's. You're refusing his offer to purchase and own you. And the craziest part about Jesus is that he will let you do that. 
He's not going to force you. He's not going to fight you. He only offers discipleship. He only offers true life to those who want it. So discipleship step number one, renounce any claim to your own life and sign yourself over to Jesus. Which, by the way, simply put, we often call repentance and faith. Turning from your kingdom building and trusting Jesus, submitting to him as king. All right, step one. We've all got that one down. So step number two, take up your cross and follow me. Now, Jesus understands that the self-life will not go willing. He understands it's not, it's not easy for us to hand over the keys to him. It's not easy for us to let go of our control. And so we actually have to do violence to the self-life. We have a difficult time letting go of self-centeredness, of self-ownership, of, of self-governance. We're, we're tied to this world and the things of this world. Therefore, the self must actively be put to death. It must be crucified. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was famously executed, he was a German pastor in the 30s and 40s. He was executed by the Nazis just days before Um, Germany was taken over by the Allies. He once wrote this. He wrote, When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. For the disciples then, a command to take up your cross, would they would have envisioned a very public death sentence. Because those in their society who were condemned by death to death by crucifixion, were forced, just like Jesus was, to carry their crosses, sometimes over a great distance in front of of crowds, to the place where they would be hung on it, and they would eventually breathe their last. So the disciples would understand that to take up your cross is a powerful, violent, vivid word picture of the kind of life that Jesus is calling his followers to live. The Latin word for cross is crux, C-R-U-X. And we get the word crucifixion and crucify from that Latin word. And it's also where we get many other words. So um, the word excruciating. You familiar with that word? E-X-C-R-U-C, aiding, E-A-ing. Excruciating literally means out of the cross. So excruciating pain is pain like you were dying on a cross. And there's another word, and it serves as the part of this week's sermon title, and the word is cruciform, that comes from cross, and it literally means shaped like a cross. So to live a cruciform life, to walk in a cruciform way, is to live a life that is crossed shape, and that is the kind of life that Jesus is calling his followers to live. A life of willingly laying down our lives, setting aside all claims to our lives, walking a road that will include suffering for Jesus' sake. A cruciform life is a life that looks and acts like Jesus. And like Jesus, we will not inherit a kingdom by going around and bypassing suffering. A truly well-lived life not only includes suffering, but is redeemed by suffering. For you and I, a a cruciform life like Jesus, it probably won't end up in a violent death, but it will mean willingly sacrificing ourselves, our priorities, our preferences, our time, our resources, all of that in service to Jesus and others. So it could play out in the little things, like overlooking a little offense when somebody snubs us or does something that hurts our feelings. It might mean being patient with difficult people or practicing sacrificial generosity by giving away our time, our talents, our treasures. It might mean loving someone who hates you, like Jesus said, love your enemies. But it might also mean bigger things for for our lives. Maybe Jesus would ask you to sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. Maybe he would ask you to go on mission with him to the ends of the world, to another place, another culture, to tell others about Jesus on the other side of the world. Maybe it would mean 
literally laying your life down for him. But at the end of the day, what Jesus is simply calling us to in these verses is to be all in on him. Jesus wants us to be all in. That's the gist of these few verses. So so what does it look like to live this cruciform life of discipleship? It, It takes what we like to call around here radical dependence. That is a crazy amount of faith to trust that Jesus is worth it, that what he says is true, and that he is the only one who in the end, at the end of the day, can truly grant us the true life that we've always wanted that can truly give us our souls. And if Jesus is all of this, then the appropriate response is obvious. Lay it down. Throw in with Jesus, with all that you have. I mean, he's gracious, he's patient, he will walk with us at our pace if we seek to follow him. He doesn't leave room, though, for half-hearted discipleship. In the end, Jesus wants you to give him everything. Now, the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus doesn't ask you to go somewhere he hasn't been himself. In the end, Jesus is the only one, excuse me, Jesus is the one who freely lays down his life. He lays down his soul, his very self, And he does that in exchange for ours. And because of this great exchange that we have in the gospel, we're able to give our lives back to him. So Jesus isn't talking here about earning or working our way into heaven. He's not talking about making sure your behavior lines up so that you get all the gold stars when you get to heaven. He's talking about a gift a freely given gift, even the, even the grace to believe, even the grace to follow, even the grace to lay down your life, to give it up, that is all a gift. It all comes from Him. And this is the gift we remember, this is the gift we magnify, this is the, the gift we, th- we think on and we even ingest as we come to the Lord's table every week. Remember that Jesus has laid down his body. He has spilled his blood so that we could be redeemed, bought with a price. So as you come this morning to the table, I'd invite you to consider and remember the price that was paid for your life. It's not your own. You can never pay Jesus back, but he does ask you to give it freely, fully, and joyfully back to him. And you can hear this and take it to the bank, that when you do that, your life will be in good hands. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we think of these heavy words from Jesus, this call to radical discipleship, this call to laying it all down and giving it all to you, trusting you with our eternal souls. God, we confess this morning that we hold on to so many things. We try to build our kingdoms. We have a hard time letting go of control of ourself. So would you give us the grace today to take up a cross, take up our cross and to follow you, to die to ourselves, to to deny ourselves, to hand over the rights of ourselves to you, what you have for us. Lord, we need, we need your grace, we need your strength, and we are thankful as we look to your cross that we have a Savior who has come and who's given it all, who's laid it down, who's poured out his blood so that we could have true and full life. God, may we experience that even this morning as we come to the table, as we take of the bread and the cup. May we experience the grace that you have given us and the life that you have given us. Lord, we love you. We want to live for you. And we need your strength to do it. So be with us this week as we go. Help us to love you and love others fully. It's in your name we pray. Amen.